Okay, so welcome to the Art Consciousness and Protest. Can't Art stop? A war and save the planet talk. Um, we have Carol Wells and Nadia Connors here. I'm going to cut the introduction short just because we're already behind schedule. Um, and I'm just going to let them speak. So give them a hand. Make life easier. Well, thank you all for coming. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Carol Wells. I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, an archive of over 80,000 human rights and protest posters going back to the 19th century. We collect and exhibit these posters as a way of not only recording and the, the history of the movement, which tells stories that you rarely hear, you rarely learn in schools because most people just a, don't want to teach about them, or B, don't even know about them to teach about them. So we have, um, we have over three dozen exhibits that travel around the world. There's, three dozen, there's uh, 13 of them on our website, politicalgraphics.org. So that's up there. And we are open to visitors and classes, so you know, contact us and come and visit. So to keep within my time, I'm going to start right away um, and just really talk about that art is powerful. Art is the most powerful weapon we have. A gun can change your behavior, but it can't change your mind. And art will change people's minds. And so um, this, this is a fabulous uh, a poster by a, a Polish artist named Lex Drewinski. And it's showing, literally, visually showing the power of the poster as a Molotov cocktail, but it's a an intellectual, a physical, you know, not, 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 the, not the weapon that we're used to hearing about, but a, a, a much more subtle, much more effective weapon. The title of the talk, Can Art Stop a War and Save the Planet? I'll tell you right now, the answer is yes, as long as it goes hand in hand with organizing and people doing that kind of educational work. But art has been used throughout the centuries to start wars and to recruit for wars. And this uh, poster from 1914 was used to recruit people in, in, uh, for World War I in, uh, in Britain. Then you see the same exact, you know, they didn't need to be original. The same exact pointing of the finger, Uncle Sam wants you, was then copied, the gesture was copied and reimagined re by Montgomery Flagg in 1917. The US government continues to use this poster today. This poster was used to recruit for the Vietnam War, it was used to recruit for the Iraq-Afghan War, and you know, unless we can prevent them from going to Syria, this poster is going to be printed again. So that's kind of our mission today. Um, and then the same, the Soviets they used the same thing in 1920 by Dmitry Moore. So for art to be effective, it doesn't have to be original. It has to grab your attention. And so in that way, it's very different from the fine arts where originality and uniqueness and value are, are one side of the equation and effective communication is on the side of the equation of the political poster. I also want to just you know, remind everybody that there's never been a viable movement for social change without the arts at the center of that movement. We cannot think of the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution or the Cuban Revolution without their posters. We cannot think about the Civil Rights Movement without their music. So the arts, whether it's music or theater or poetry or film or posters, is at the center of every, every viable movement for social change. The same image now was used by the Vietnam War protesters, but now to oppose the war. So I want out, 1971. Uh, this was to oppose the first Gulf War, 1991. And this one uh, juxtaposes Bush number one. And they really start looking alike, so you have to kind of look carefully. But Bush number one. But this is not only using that same Uncle Sam Wants You image to oppose the war, but it's linking issues. The very you know, concept of this conference about how to link issues and the importance of linking issues. Uncle George wants you to forget failing banks, education, drugs, AIDS, poor health care, unemployment, crime, racism, corruption, and have a good war. This poster is over 20 years old. There's not one line on there that couldn't be said right now. That's, that's frightening. This one was done to oppose then the Iraq-Afghanistan war uh, in 2002. And now, you're, now, now Uncle Sam has been transformed into Osama bin Laden. And now the issue is, that's being combined with the anti-war statement is an ecological statement. 
So it says, I want you to drive an SUV. My secret weapon of mass destruction is the best-selling vehicle in America. Uh, fund terrorists, pollute the environment, and kill infidels. And I had this in an exhibit opposing the war, and you could tell by people's reaction when they walked in if they owned an SUV or they didn't. If they didn't, they laughed. If they did, they moved fast by the, to the next piece. Um, this, how many have seen this poster before? Not everybody, but not everybody, but a lot. This, the, the, this was the most widely distributed poster during the Vietnam War. Uh, I think over half a million, they estimate, were made at different times. And, and servicemen in Vietnam would write to have, have new copies sent to them because for whatever reason they would disappear. And so it was a very, a very gentle statement. It's amazing that even think, actually, that anybody could be offended by it. Who's, a, who's, who's against children's health and who's not, you know, for peace? But a friend of mine had one in her yard, and she kept coming back to buy another one. And I said, why do you need so many? She said, somebody keeps ripping it. So uh, to this, and then, you know, like the 21st century, this still manages to push people's buttons. But this is also combining, it's talking about its anti-war statement. Uh, it's done by Lorraine Schneider, a woman in Beverly Hills. 1965 was the first time she did a, a small graphic, and then it kept getting, you know, in different formats, including the necklace I'm wearing. But it's also talking about the destruction of the environment that was going on in Vietnam. The, the, um, the U.S. used napalm and Agent Orange. Agent Orange, you know, was, um, uh, was a um, defoliant and anti-person, and defoliant and, um, and um, basically killed all the plants, and herbicide, and, age, and na napalm was anti-personnel, and it was like a soapy, sticky substance that burned at over a thousand degrees and uh, centigrade and water just spread it. Water did not put it out. So literally burnt, you know, burnt to the bone. And it was actually used in, in Japan during World War II. Very few people know about it. This is a Berkeley poster from 1970. It's using that slogan for Coke. I think they still use the same slogan. It's the real thing, but it's the real thing for Southeast Asia. When people talk about the use of chemical warfare and there are all the accusations about what the Syrians are doing, uh, they don't talk about the fact that U.S. used chemical warfare, you know, in almost every war we've been in, if not every war, and, but napalm and Agent Orange are still affecting people, both our own servicemen who were, who were exposed to it and, of course, the people in Vietnam. This is a Swedish poster from 19, about 1970, and it's the first time I've ever seen the word ecocide used. Um, this was right around the, you know, the early days of the, of the environmental movement, but it's specifically saying stop the U.S. ecocide in Indochina. You see the defoliated trees on top and the Vietnamese uh, on the bottom. The next series of, uh, the next, a series of photographs that came from a January 1967 issue of Ramparts magazine. And I want to show you this, some, several pieces from this magazine. The introduction was by, um, by Dr. Spock, and then the rest was a photo essay by William Pepper on the children of Vietnam and the effect of the U.S. war, especially napalm on the children. And I want to tell you a little story about how art changed, looking at these photographs changed Martin Luther King's life. In January 67, King was at an airport waiting to, he was taking a sabbatical. He was, he was just needed some rest. He was taking off for a month. And as you know, he'd been, he'd been warned by his advisors, do not bring up Vietnam. Do not deal with international issues. Stick to your single focus. Stick to civil rights movement, domestic issues. Stick to that. Do not broaden your focus. And he listened to them. He, he, at one level, I'm sure he knew, I know he knew that that wasn't the answer, but he listened to his advisors. Then he's at the airport, and he just starts, you know, picking a bunch of magazines to read on the plane. This was one of them. He's having lunch with a friend, and he starts flipping through this magazine, and all of a sudden, he pushes his food away. And his friend says, something wrong with your food. And King says, nothing will taste good again until we stop this war. And this magazine, these photos I'm about to show you, are what convinced King that he had to do the right thing and take on Vietnam. 
And in May of that year, so this was January, in May of the same year, he gave his, you know, his, his important Vietnam speech, and a year to the day he was assassinated. And most people think it was because of the Vietnam speech, because he broadened his issues, was, it made him the target for assassination. So these photos didn't just change his life, but changed the course of US history. So um, uh, just, you know, these, these kind of, I know, grisly photos. I want to notice the one on the lower left, the, the child with his face basically melted away, was made into a poster. So they first appeared in Ramparts, and then they not only affected King, but then they were used to, to publicize the issue. Uh, this other one, look at the child on the right with the one hand, also made into a poster. I can, neither ho I can hold neither a dove nor a hawk in my hand. Um, and then, of course, the, the most, one of the, the poster that changed the, another course of history. How many people are, have, are familiar with this photograph? Much less than they were familiar with the war is not healthy. This was a, a photograph of a massacre in My Lai, a small village in Vietnam, that was, the massacre occurred in March 1967. It was kept secret from the American public for over a year. It wasn't secret from the Vietnamese, obviously, and this wasn't a unique massacre. What was unique was that this photograph became public, because the US government documents everything they do. It was revealed by an independent journalist, Seymour Hersh, the same journalist who revealed Abu Ghraib. It's amazing how, how one journalist can come up with this, these stories that literally change people's consciousness in a major way. The text came from an interview with Mike Wallace, who's one of the soldiers. And literally, there were, there were between 350 and, and, and almost 600 people murdered. We don't know exactly how many. Most of the women were raped and tortured. It was, if, if you read the transcripts, it, it's absolutely grisly. And it was only stopped because one U.S. service person in, an el in, a, in a helicopter saw what was coming on and literally turned his gun on his own troops and said, if you shoot one more person, I'm going to shoot you. And it kind of like was the cold water or the slap in the face that stopped the carnage. But when the, when the photo came out, there was an interview with Mike Wallace, and Mike Wallace asked the soldier, and babies? And the soldier answered, and babies. Because it was mainly women and children, babies, elderly men. No gun was ever found, in, no, fire, no, no, no gun fire ever came from the village. It was a search and destroy. So the next day, the New York Times reproduced the dialogue, Q and babies, A and babies. And the Art Workers Coalition in New York, this is pre-Photoshop, pre-computer. They had to take a camera, blow it up. That's why it's so you know, a little, little blurry. And then they made 50,000 copies of the poster. You know the slogan, if it bleeds, it leads. Well, you know, photographs are in and out of consciousness when they're, when they're the headlines. But the poster kept it before people's consciousness. The poster is now taught a whole bunch of people in this room about this, 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 this image, this massacre. And it's, it continues to resonate in, uh, well, in a lot of people's uh, consciousness. Same thing with this photograph from Abu Ghraib. It became posters. The My Lai massacre poster, photograph and poster, before that became public, the majority of the people in this country supported the Vietnam War. They believed the lies and they supported the war. After they saw this massacre, they could no longer justify the war because this is the, they didn't want their tax dollars used for this. So that was really the beginning of the anti-war sentiment becoming much broader. Same thing with the Abu Ghraib. The majority of the people in this country believe the lies. I mean, still people believe that the Saddam Hussein was behind the World Trade Center bombing. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of like astounding, but it's still, people still believe it. But after the Abu Ghraib photos came out, that's really what changed people's consciousness. And they started becoming really much more actively against the war. Um, one of, this was really used very effectively, both by a New York artist and an LA artist who came up with the exact same idea. This is right when the iPod ad first came out, that very, the, the, pro, the, the silhouette with the dancing figurines. They both made, un, unbeknownst, they didn't know about each other, they made, they took the form of the iPod ad, inserted Abu Ghraib, and then both of them inserted it into the real iPod ads. <laughs> and this is one of the most, perfect examples of culture jamming that I can yeah. imagine. 
because it sticks in your head. After I saw the fake one, the Abu Ghraib one, I could never see a real iPod ad without doing a double take and saying, is that the real one or is that the anti-war one? So it's kind of like a slogan, a product slogan. It, once it gets in your head, and that's the power of the visual, once it gets in your head, it's there. It's there. Uh, the ecology movement really you know, started in, uh, I think, well, the first Earth Day was 1970. But everything builds on something else. Everything comes from something that happened before. And Rachel Carlson's book from 1962, Secret Spring, is really what, uh, what, what started the, the modern environmental movement. And another event also kicked it off. Just bef this, was a, a 19, this was a 1970 poster about the Santa Barbara oil spill, which happened in January and February 1969. At the time, it was the largest oil spill in the United States. And to this day, now, 2012, 2013, it ranks as the third after the 2010 Deepwater Horizon and the 1989 uh, Exxon Valdez. So, and it still is the largest oil spill off the coast of California. Between uh, 80 and 100,000 gallons within a 10-day period leaked out. And so that, that poster was done for that. That really, that event of that California oil spill then kind of triggered people's outrage to then lead to the teach-ins that led to the first Earth Day in 1970. This one was done in 2010 after the, the, uh, the um, you know, British Petroleum oil spill. So you got the, the British Petroleum logo on the dead fish, and it doesn't say instead of RIP for rest in peace, it's RIBP for British Petroleum. This is another one dealing with that, also the same year, 2010, with the, um, with the British Petroleum logo now is the setting sun, and the death, of course, is the oil spill. That's kind of a sobering poster in a city that we live in. This one's from 1991. Um, and you kind of, you know, we, fortunately, I don't think we see as many days like this, but there are still days like this. Um, this is a 1970 ACLU poster. So here they are from LA, you know, linking the issues between civil rights and, and pollution. You know, clean air is a civil right. So another linking of issues. This is a Polish post, same guy who did the Molotov cocktail poster, uh, Lex Jawinski. So, you know, kind of like, you know, showing it very direct. I saw this is a poster from 1992. I remember when I first saw this, I said, oh my God, I didn't real, I hear the term clear cutting. But what, it, you know, now I really know what it means because I see the picture. You know, and it says, your taxes pay for the destruction of your national forests. Speak out against the madness. Uh, also, a, a 1990s poster. And this was the um, Rainforest Action Network, and they had a, a multi-year boycott against Mitsubishi, which ultimately Mitsubishi agreed to change its environmental uh, actions, and um, they called off the boycott in 1998. But that was, you know, again, you don't, you have to really be on top of them to know it's true. A German poster. Uh, showing very graphically the world coming to a boiling point, and it's kind of anti-ad. This is 1988. 1988. It's the, what, what you can read the selection, the uh, translations up there. We bring the poles to the melting point. Uh, 1998, a, a poster from Tokyo, warning against warming, the penguin shedding his coat. Uh, 2002 from Luxembourg, Greenpeace, Some Like It Hot, same series, Water World. This could be Colorado or Mexico today. Um, genetically Modified Food, 2004. And people say, oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but you get human genes now put into pigs, so it's not so far-fetched. Uh, they, this was part of an action from 2012, from, from last year, an action to close down the Monsanto factory in Davis, and they actually shut it down four times. Uh, a Munich, Germany, uh, anti-genetically modified food. Uh, you know, you the idea is you take something familiar like, the, you know, the girl on the salt, and all of a sudden you have the umbrella shredded by acid rain. Makes people look, makes people read it, 1982. This is a, another poster from Tokyo in 1997, uh, talking about uh, protecting the ozone level. Of course, they're being, you know, the rainforests are being destroyed. 
stop pesticide use. This is from Malaysia from the 1980s. And of course, pesticide. Rachel Carson wrote about the danger of DDT in, in 1962. It took 10 years for the United States to stop the use of DDT. And this is a 1969 Berkeley poster. Uh, caution, the, the breast milk of the pregnant woman, caution, not fit for human consumption. This is a, uh, a, a French anarchist poster. The logic of profit is the logic of death. And there's waste and, and pollution and oil spills and genetically modified food all in the background. Uh, New York poster, 2005, and you basically are shown a choice, you know, nuclear destruction or life. Now this is, take it to Wall Street, stop nuclear investments. There's action on Wall Street. This was not Occupy. This was 1979. Hmm. So there's a history that we don't even know of people before us who are doing similar concepts. This poster is not one of my favorite way it looks, but for what it says, it's astounding. Mm -hmm. One hamburger equals 12 pounds of grain plus 55 square feet of rainforest plus 2,500 of gallons of water to produce one hamburger. 1971, kind of humorous. Do you give a shit about water pollution? Well, people could be, you know, have a little humor about it then. It's obviously a lot more serious now. Or maybe it was serious then, but we didn't realize it. Uh, this is one from 2011, talking about, you know, poisoned groundwater, fracking lemonade, not for consumption. I first saw this, I thought it was a doll. It was only when reading it and I realized it was a, somebody's baby. And this was redone, this was a child, one of, the, one of the thousands who died as a result of the Bhopal disaster in, uh, in India, the world, still the world's worst industrial accident, and they still haven't been compensated. Not that you can compensate for over 20,000 deaths, but the real face of globalization says it all. Melbourne, Australia, 2006. This was kind of a stunning one, too. People today recognize fewer than 10 plants, but over 1,000 corporate logos. I now go around whenever I see a plant. Do I know what that is? <laughs> this is a real soldier. He's wearing his real medals. Those are his real prosthetics. He wanted to have this done, and this, this poster was really criticized by, by a lot of Republicans for how dare you exploit the soldier. <laughs> And crude reality obviously has multiple meanings. Um, this is one of them. Uh, a poster from uh, 1994 dealing with the Iraq war and it asks and answers the question at the same time. Iraq, why? And it shows you, oil. Uh, our Arctic way of life has endured for 20,000 years. Must we now die for six months of oil? 2001. Shell on Earth, uh, Hell on Earth. Shell, I, I, I refuse to buy Shell oil. I mean, oh, they're all bad, but Shell somehow has stepped over the line because they're involved with not only ecological destruction, but human rights abuses and murder to protect their right to ecologically exploit uh, in, in Nigeria. They, they were involved with the, with the hanging, with the framing and the hanging of activists, including Ken Sarawiwo in, 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 in Nigeria. Uh, the second time I found Ecoside in a poster, 2001, uh, and it's also linking issues. So it's against the free trade area of the Americas, but it's linking Ecoside, war, and poverty. Um, and uh, 2007, German, United Colors of Resistance taking on the Benetton ad, and it says, we blocked it, we are everywhere, we are winning. Now, again, this is five, four years before Occupy, but this was the brilliant, the genius of Occupy, okay? It brought that, we are the 99%. It really brought the idea of class consciousness to a level that people could understand it. And it's still in the dialogue, it's still in the conversation. And finally, my last poster is a German Green Party poster from the 1980s, and it says, we've only borrowed the earth from our children. Thank you. Um, I am a writer and a filmmaker and an artist and an activist, and um, this is one of my favorite topics of conversation is the power of art and consciousness change. Um, I've had a lot of experience, and I'll get into a couple of different examples. Your talk was great. The, the work that you've done is amazing, and that you can share this history with people. And, and I'm, every time I look at your, the work that you've done, I'm reminded 
of the legacy that we all inherit. And I'm also reminded of another thing, which is sort of kind of like where I'm coming at. I, I made a film called The 11th Hour. I don't know if you, if you saw The 11th Hour. Um, and um, it's, oh, wow, there you go. Awesome. <laughs> And actually, this is, I'm really glad you have this for a number of reasons. But um, one of those, I do want to actually talk about the poster. But the experience of making a film where the intention was to shift consciousness, and, and, and how do you do that, and, and realizing the, the most powerful lesson that I learned is that, yes, if somebody is willing to show up and listen, and if you've created something that has sort of a, you know, a modicum of artistic, you know, value and, and sort of um, spiritual, emotional value. Um, you can speak to people, but fundamentally, I feel that you can't change, you can change consciousness with art, but you cannot necessarily change the world. And I think your examples are amazing, like the, the, the Martin Luther King example is unbelievable and, and I, and I'm sure there's a lot of work. You know, I don't know if anybody's read to the Finland Station, um, which is all about the reading and acting of history. So you read something, and it's a Edmund Wilson. I don't know if anyone's read it, but it's it's all about how you can. He tracked popular works, uh, written works, and how right after that it created revolutionary change. And so it's sort of the dialectic of history through that. But where I feel like we are now, and getting back to my experience with the 11th hour, is that you can, you can, you can activate, you can change people's minds, and I'm not it's from coming from an authoritative position of, of knowing how one's mind should be changed. I am a, as much changed by the information and the art that I participate in as the viewer. So, um, but what do you do with it? And, and I think, the thing that I came to over and over again is the need for fellowship. And this, what is happening today is an example of fellowship. It's a Saturday and everyone's coming here. They're coming together. And the, I can tell you, it's like, it was almost like a scientific experiment that we did uh, without realizing it. The screenings that we had of our film that were hosted, whether it was in a movie theater or in somebody's home, if one of the filmmakers was there, or one of the many people we interviewed, or anybody that was interested in the subject matter was there, with the intention of talking about the film, the difference was um, unquantifiable in a sense, or it was, it, it, there was no comparison between going to see a film and talking about it afterwards versus going to a film and just leaving. And whatever happens to you in your car on your way home, I think that what we're up against is you can drive down the street and be activated by a poster. You can have your, you can see something in a magazine. You can hear about something on the news. You can feel less alone because there's an artistic interpretation of what's happening in the world. But what do you do with it? How do you make change based on this idea? And I think I became profoundly depressed after sitting in, uh, you know, Q and A and Q and A after Q and A and getting a better result from that, but still hearing that where do you take this action? Like, where do you go with it? And so I think that our work in, in the, you know, particularly after Occupy and the successes and I don't even want to say the failures of Occupy because I, I, I think that's the popular media's um, way of dismissing the power of that movement. Um, but where do you take an artistic, like, Occupy a profoundly purely artistic movement that somehow managed to articulate something that people couldn't articulate for, for a very long time. And how do you take this idea of where we've come to in, and this is like, I want to open up this to a conversation. How do you take where we've come to, you have our abilities in, in the United States. We have a certain luxury of protesting as art. In other parts of the world, protest is, you know, a life or death. You participate in a protest, you could be dragged from your house in the middle of the night. We have an extraordinary amount of 
freedom to do certain things, but what, how are our minds not free? Like how are we, how do we have this freedom and yet what do we do with this freedom? And this opens up the question of one of the most profound things I think Occupy did was break the spell. Stand in front of the wound. Say, we may not have an answer, but we're gonna be present to show you this wound. And what I'd like to, what I'd like to talk about is that you've thrown out a, a, a few different things. Is I wanna talk about the idea of human fellowship, activism, and art. And how do we, particularly, I don't even wanna think globally, I wanna think about the city of Los Angeles. How do we use this dynamic to create a better, more equal, more beautiful city? Um, and, and how do you go from inspiration to activation? So I, I have some thoughts about that, but I, I want to sort of like open it up a little bit to the group and, and, and ask that question, have you felt um, activated by art? And if so, has it led you to something specific? And then the Billy Holiday stuff. Great song, Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the, uh, uh, yeah. and still very cultured today. At, 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 so soon after Trayvon Martin, you know, it's still mm -hmm. Strange Fruit. I, I actually were working on a film with, with Sarah Mason about protest, which um, I would love to get your information because I would love to invite you to, because it is a meditative, um, experimental art piece on the actual experience of participating in a protest. And it follows four protesters from the moment they wake up in the morning to um, the, the sort of height of the protest and when you lose them in the crowd. And, and, and you start from that, the, the, the intimacy with them alone on a pillow as they get into larger and larger groups until they join and get lost in the crowd. And, I, I was moved by a famous photograph, and I'm forgetting the name, of a anti-Vietnam War protest where it just was on, it was in LA on Wilshire Boulevard, and it was as far as the eye can see were people in a protest, and you just saw these people arm in arm at the front of the protest, and I just looked at it, and I sort of, protesting is a pastime for me for like 25 years, so I've been to, and I lived in France for four years, so I've been to many, many, many protests. And I started to become a 
the, very fascinated by the ballet of protest and the sort of um, where am I finding? Um, uh, the ebb and flow, and 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 also in, on the darker side of it, like to what end, you know? And I, I lived in one particular apartment in France where I would see protests go by, and then shortly after, like literally, they'd be half a block down the street. One of the most powerful protests I'd ever seen in my life, really well articulated, organized with incredible graphics, and really exciting. And then I would go back up to my apartment, and when they're halfway down the street, the street cleaners come, and it's gone. It's just gone. It's like it never happened. And everything returns to normal. And so, you know, this protest film that I've done with Sarah was really inspired by all of these experiences and seeing this image and also hearing at the same time in the media them constantly getting it wrong about who people in Occupy are or who these current protesters are. And what I didn't want to get into was a film that talked about politics or about the 99% or why everybody was there. And what I wanted to do was just show people. Like these are people. And I had looked at that image and I thought, these, if you could just see these people five minutes before they were standing arm in arm, were they parking their car? Did they eating a sandwich? What were they doing? And there's something so simple about that that becomes, and I'm telling, very powerful about that, and I hope you can see this film that we've done, and that is without talking, without hearing about it, you get pulled into the humanity of it and the, the bravery of taking over a street. And what does that mean and to what end? And does it matter how many people showed up? Does it matter what, the, what happens afterwards? It's the act of protesting in and of itself is an incredibly powerful, uniquely human, moment. So while that is something that is extremely, you know, of interest and importance to me, on, on the more pessimistic side, I feel like protest has been relegated to a very safe and hermetically sealed place in our culture. And it's like window dressing. It gives us the sense that we have democracy when we don't have democracy in anywhere that actually counts in our society. And we're obsessed with the idea of freedom, but we don't have a democratic workplace. We don't have a, a real idea of, of what the responsibility of freedom is. We've been told our entire lives to buy, 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 to drive, drive, drive. And all of these things have repercussions on our own bodies and our own planet. And yet we're, the loops have been broken, and while we can play, and, and, and have the, the protest art and do all of these things and be encouraged to do that on some level. The truth of the power of who we are and the, the, what, that re, what that brings to the world is, is separated from these two things. And I never experienced it more than in making a film that dealt with all of these things that activated people and yet we were trapped in a bubble over here. So that is, that I, I, I just, put that back out to everybody else to, to sort of talk about. Uh, first, I just want to open by saying I was so impressed by both of these presentations. I, I've seen a lot of the posters before, but I've never seen them quite like this. So Carol, I really appreciated this. And I, I really, um, I'd like to comment on what you were talking about, because I think that protest politics has become, in the last maybe 40, 30, 40 years, what people do, and people now call themselves activists. Back in the day, we called ourselves organizers. Mm, absolutely. World of difference yeah. right there. Yeah. Um, and if we look at the last 40 years, I'm talking about the bubble sort of you're talking mm -hmm. about. If we look at the gains the right wing has done, the Tea Party, they, I mean, they've had a couple of little demos, but they don't have these huge demonstrations. They don't. They go and they run for dog catcher and their PTA board and they organize in their church and their communities. Mm -hmm. And they gain power and they do it quietly. They don't need to have huge protest march because they're doing it differently. They're learning from what we did in the 60s. Okay, and so I think that the, the pendulum of becoming conscious through art, through whatever means has now translated into either clicking a button on a computer or being in a demonstration. And I think both of those things have their place. I think they're important.
But I think that one thing that's really important that's gotten lost from that whole that whole mix, and that's just one of you said fellowship, feeling each other, knowing each other, organizing together. That the whole thing of organizing, of working in your community, of of having a group and learning together and becoming active together has been lost. So I just wanted to sort of yeah. say that I hope that some of the art and some of the protests will start to put organizing instead of activism back in the mix of, in, of regaining our country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So can you raise your hands up? Um, and also just for the sake of time, I'm going to limit people to like two minutes. Um, if you can, you know, just so we can get as many hands as up as uh, so. we have, we have uh, 20 minutes. So, um, gentlemen in the green. Judy? Uh, I'd first of all like to thank both the speakers. I, I think the presentations were phenomenal in, in what they um, let you take a look at. In case you forgot it, boy, those uh, posters make you remember it again. Um, and art is so important. Of whether it be visual art or drama or uh, speaking, even uh, to get people going, and and the wonderful comments you made about what it means to you when you look at a demonstration and try to make a film about it. I just want to say a couple of things about demonstrations because you have to look at history. Um, there was a Paris Commune, which I'm sure many of you radicals know what it was. And there's a wonderful, wonderful museum in Saint Denis, France, of the Paris Commune. And it has the most wonderful posters oh, really? from that Paris Commune. And they are breathtaking. I had to have someone translate them for me, because I don't speak or read French, but they were wonderful, and they, despite the fact that the Paris Commune only lasted a very short time, what those people did in closing down Paris, in making a difference, in taking over the Catholic Church and all its money,
because what is the Catholic Church, it belongs to the people, and they took it back and gave it to the people. I mean, they have wonderful posters about that within uh, the Paris Commune. And if you look at um, labor movements and labor strikes in this country where people, uh, it's always the poorest, the hardest hit, um, Harlan County coal miners, yeah. uh, oh my God, uh, they don't have a pot to piss in, but they're out there demanding their lives and they get, um, such rewards, even if it goes away after a while, it changes them and it changes the world you live in. And that changes everything. Mm -hmm. And you just have to keep fighting. Um, Wrap up, please. And it isn't only activity. You're absolutely right. It's organizing. It's thinking. It's you can talk about what you don't want, up, but please. what do you want? I think that becomes very key. Can I just say something? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. It's so it, it, interest, it, interesting what you're talking about. You know, people used to say after they saw the eleventh hour, "What are the ten things that I can do?" And I knew it, 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 it's like at the time they wanted to know, like, change your light bulb, buy a Prius, recycle, or whatever. You know, and the effort in the conversation was to shift it towards organization, fellowship, community. Um, and to, to, I think we've gotten to a place in our culture, not necessarily obviously with the people in this room, you guys are extraordinary people for caring and showing up and organizing, but to most people, our culture is saying, click it, check it off the list, it's non-transformational. And the sad thing about that is we'd want to be transformed. And it's like these two things need to happen. We need to transform our economy. We need to transform our relationship to the planet. We need to transform ourselves. And the very thing that we could do that would be self-transformational, it's a to-do list. It's a consumptive act. It's not a physical act. So I think it's just your passion just inspired me to, to recount that story. And when people used to ask me what are the 10 things I can do, I would always say that, you know, a change of heart and consciousness is free. And what you do with that, I could never predict. Like if you're studying architecture or art or whatever it is that you're doing, you will bring that consciousness change to your work. And if I limit you with go change your light bulb, that's just like, you know, and that I think has been a big problem with, with some of these movements is it's dumbed down the enormity of the, this reality and that it will change you forever. And I think that we're, you know, we, we're afraid, of, when I say we, I think the meta culture is afraid of that kind of transformation because when that happens, you're not going to participate in everything else that we expect you to participate in. It, it comes back to consumption all the time. Anyway, that's In the greener here. I am. The piece of art that I think most transformed my, uh, my life was a uh, Seeing Salt of the Earth, which is a 1954 film, my favorite film of all time. Um, just a, a, is a mind blower. And I've always been a writer since before I could write.
not just politically important, but also emotionally and dramatic film. Thank you. Roz? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, well, I'm also an artist. Um, I come from Philadelphia. Um, I believe that the primary focus for an artist or someone who calls themselves an artist is to, is to evoke an emotion, is to create an experience that consists of all of the emotions or all of the different sensuality the person would go through without actually having to experience or endure a certain situation. In my view, that's art is a form of expression. It's another voice, another vessel, another way. And as you said earlier, it's an extraordinary freedom, but I think that's as limited as we take it. If you go to say that this is a freedom out of what freedoms we are limited to or given, that's as far as you'll take it. As an artist, your goal is to create the experience, regardless of how you will be condemned, how people may interpret it, how they, how all of the backlash you may receive from it. It's about creating that experience completely, especially in something that involves activism, that involves social change, that involves shifting of consciousness. And yes, I do agree that art changes the, the way that we conceive situations, but I do think it can change the world. Um, I'm a performer, I'm a dancer. I went to school for it, I've been doing it my whole life. Um, I've gotten people to change. Ways that they viewed, I've, he said, he brought up Strange Room earlier. Yeah. I did a, a piece um, uh, that was done to the poem Strange Fruit about a white woman's reaction to a man hanging um, from a, a tree, an invisible tree, but the ways that you evoke the emotion when you become the actual subject, when you become the actual experience, and allow it to kind of come through you to people, it does not only shift consciousness, but the activity. Because unlike words, unlike things that you can write or say orally or voice, you know, we leave visual images that can stick in people's heads like memories they've never had before. Mm -hmm. Like dreams, you know, you have dreams that change your entire way of perceiving. Mm -hmm. Or you, you see something that you, you never imagined seeing before and it sticks with you, almost like post-traumatic stress for me, you know? And it's like, as an artist, I think that's our main goal is to Wrap create up. that stress, to create that experience where people are so moved that they can't, you know, it's not just consciousness, it's like actually, this is where I am now, this is the world that I'm in, and what am I gonna do to change it? Because this, this is what it's done to me. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, I'd like to focus on this poster up there because it's more than just simply this is an organizing tool to create the very fellowship that we were discussing, okay? Because this is a political party from Germany that was trying to focus on and pull people together around consciousness about what's happening to the environment. Now, I'm assuming this is at least 10 years old. Eight, early 80s. But it's also part of a series. It's not a one-off thing, you know, dealing with a specific event. <coughs> series of, I, mean, I just saw some more of them not too recently, it's a series put out by a political organization trying to create a new identity, a new organizational identity, and recruit people to that, to the purposes that they are beginning to express. It's very different from our political posters where you have advertising images of a particular candidate, and you're purchasing the candidate. You can take a look at Exhibit of all the Obama things, right? All the Obama mm -hmm. posters. This is Madison Avenue type stuff. That is a very different uh, kind of uh, graphic with a very different intention. And I think that's what we need to, if we're going to organize these various campaigns, it's not a one of thing, but it's a series that will draw people into the fellowship and be used as an organizing. Thank you. The, in the green, yeah. Um, I wanted to follow up on some of what Roz was saying, and the gentleman, uh, right before. Um, I was in uh, Chile uh, during the time of Salvador Allende and saw what it was to have a whole society uh, grow out of a movement themselves. And at that time, I 
realize that there has never been a successful social movement that did not have its own culture. You know, a cultural revolution Absolutely. within it mm -hmm. and part of it. Mm -hmm. And we can look at the United Farm Workers uh, mm -hmm. unions, their their color, their symbolism, their their every rally was a song, was a sing fest, was a was a, a, a unity. In Chile, the walls became the people's the people's gallery, mm -hmm. and you could not go anywhere without seeing. And they had brigades even before uh, coming to power. They could they could come in, find find a wall, and with a crew of people in in 15 minutes before the police or anybody you know tran transform that that thing. And it was an act of defiance. It wasn't uh, uh, an act of rebellion, but it was a it was a consciousness uh, raising for the community and others. And what Ross was saying uh, in terms of reaching the the emotions, those of us who are uh, diehard uh, socialists and all usually are trying to reach the American people and everybody all up here. You know, you know, we got to have the best arguments. If we don't open up people's heart and soul, they may not open up their minds. And most young people, uh, I say this a lot in, in San Diego, their first consciousness comes from the arts, comes from music. So my challenge in terms of music, uh, in terms of movement building, is there are people doing. Uh, Hip hop and spoken word and graphic artists that are disconnected from the left. Yet, what they are doing, what they are saying, their sentiments, their emotions are in rebellion to the status quo. They may not recognize uh, imperialism or the roots of, of, of war and, and uh, uh, ecological chaos as, as being capitalism, but they feel it. And so it's our job to bring those people Wrap up, please. into the movement and, and be educated by them as well. Thank you. So I'd like to bring it back to the panelists. If you guys want to answer anything, or well, we just have one for questions. I have a question. Is, do you feel, in terms of poster art, um, that the internet and clicking and any of that has had an impact on production of? Well, there's actually a poster renaissance that I give two things credit for. One is George Bush and his and the unpopular war. Nothing inspires artists like an unpopular, illegal, immoral <laughs> war. And, and the internet, because one of the problems poster artists always had is distribution. I mean, you can make things kind of easily. Well, I can't, but relatively easily. But the problem is getting them out there. And I mean, we have so many posts in the center because posters made in the 60s, 70s, 80s never got just fully distributed. So they were stuck in somebody's you know, closet. But the internet makes distribution instantaneous. And if people want, and what's, what is happening, o Occupy did it, the, the uh, immigration movement has done it. With, there's a website called altoarizona.org, mm -hmm. and then the, there's several Occupy websites. You can go through and pick the, pick the poster you want, and it's high enough resolution, you can download it. The Cuban Five have all these posters. If you, when you pick the one you want, you download it. So people are actually, it's, it's a much, much more cost effective. You're not making 100 posters, which costs a lot of money, or 1,000, and then you have to pay money to distribute them. You put them online, and what they're doing something called, um, I mean, it's the commons, it's the public. Mm -hmm. As long as you use it for non-commercial purposes in the same concept and politics that it was made for, you can use it for free. If you're going to use it for commercial purposes, or you're going to, you know, alter it, then you you need permission. So it's a whole. I, they used some people call it copy left instead of copyright, but it's not. You know. But um, so there's a lot of that going on too. So the, I think the re re internet has really created a revival of the poster, and actually even the old school silk screening is being revived because all these art schools are now, the students are finding these old silk screening machines in the basement and they say, oh, I want to learn how to do that. So the, 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 the mechanical, you know, hands-on is actually going through a revival as well. And there's all these, uh, Bay Area especially has all these collectives and silk screen artists. 
out of the Bay Area, but then there's a group called Just Seeds out of, the, out of New York yeah. that is doing uh, incredible educational posters that are really inexpensive, and it's an inter they call themselves an international collective. Mm -hmm. Syracuse. Syracuse cultural workers distributes. They're more, they don't really, they, they do produce some, but it's not like these other groups. So we're at the last two minutes. Um, is there any more questions? Like, for the could you reread, translate that for This one? Well, it's actually, uh, one thing I forgot to say, this is actually a Native American slogan. So you get the German Green Party going into Native American culture, and the slogan is, we've only borrowed the earth from our children. So again, talk about this. Mm -hmm linking of issues and linking of cultures and linking of, of consciousness. Oh, if anybody wants to sign up for our mailing list, the guy, he has a yeah, sign up. Politicalgraphics. Right. Politicalgraphics.org. Our website's on these, ha these handouts over here. Did you have a question? Helping, I mean, it clearly helps in distribution, as I mentioned. I think, I mean, to make a good poster, is that what you're specifically asking about? Well, to make a good poster, or to make, to make an image that, or a piece of art that's going to impact, have that transformative impact. It, I think the artists who make stuff that's going to have that kind of impact, they don't know they're, you know, every artist wants every piece they do. Like every poet wants every poem they make, or every songwriter, or every filmmaker. They want, this is going to, you know, this is going to be my Guernica. <laughs> and, and, you know, Picasso did one Guernica. And so it's, it's really, I think, I want to actually, I want to come back at your question slightly different. The poster that changed my life, and my life was changed by a poster, was not even a great poster. <laughs> It just happened to be the poster that caught me at a moment in my life that the message made me think and gave me one of those aha moments. It's not a great poster. So um, I actually have it here. I was carrying with me, you know, I mean, I, whenever. It, it, was a, it was a Nicaraguan poster of a, of a woman um, holding a big basket of, of, of coffee beans and why it, why it got, changed me was that I happened to see an eight or nine year old boy go over to that poster in a place that he didn't never been before, in a, in a home that his parents didn't like because they didn't share their politics. The house, home was a Sandinista home. His family were contra, you know, anti Sandinistas. And the poster attracted this child's attention because of its bold color, its graphic, its slogan. And I watched him go over to this poster, mouth the words on the poster, which were, and it was in Spanish, but in constructing the new country we are becoming the new woman and try to figure out what that meant. Mm. He didn't get feminism at home. And, I'm, and he may not even, I'm sure he didn't figure it out. But the fact of attracting his attention and making him think was the transformative moment in my life. I wasn't interested in posters at all. I was an activist, I was an art historian, I went to more demos, I went to that demo you're talking about Century City 1967 which also changed wow. my life. But, um, but I wasn't interested in posters. And that poster said, oh, that's how posters work. They have the ability, you're not going to a museum to see them. They confront you just when you're driving down the street or walking down the street or going to the subway. And there they are, and it just, something grabs you. 
and you can't, the, 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 the Martin Luther King being, a being changed by those photographs, we have no way of knowing who other, other people were changed. Obviously people learned from them. They were, they were uh, you know, appalled by them. They were angered by them, but it changed his life. And you never know what image, what message is going to affect one, what person at a moment. So it, I don't think it has, it's really, if people do what really is in their heart to have the right message, you know, it's, it's, it's going to reach, uh, well, art training does help. A lot, computer, that's the downside of computers. It makes anybody with a computer think they can make a political poster. And that's, you know, there's a lot of, fortunately, you're not killing trees to make those bad posters anymore. There's a lot of posters we have that a tree shouldn't have died for their sins, but. <laughs> you know, so that does help, but I don't think I don't think there's a formula. I think pe everybody, if, if people really did what they thought was right and good and clear and and, and about an issue, something's going to reach somebody. 